What's up guys, my name is Emil and I'd like to welcome you to the Eurotrash Motorsports YouTube channel. Now, if you have been living under a rock for the last, I don't know, eight months or so, what we're doing um, in this project, it was basically a completely rebuilding a Mercedes W201 uh, vehicle. We have taken everything down, basically uh, all of the suspension, engine out and building everything from the ground up. If you've missed all the previous episodes, click here, catch up to the point that we are discussing today. Now, I'm going to start by apologizing about how long this episode's actually taken. A few people have asked, you know, what's going on with the project? You know, is the engine done? That kind of stuff. Um, I think in general, nature has decided that we're not going to finish this project like ever. Um, I certainly had a deadline of, uh, you know, four months ago to try and get this car out of the garage because I've got a few other projects uh, lined up outside. We've got the Audi S4 that needs an engine rebuilt. We've got the Audi A4 that, uh, you know, we're having oil pressure issues with. Uh, I've got the GL truck, uh, the X164 platform that basically needs everything. Um, rear suspension, you know, oil changes, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've got an R-Class um, that my dad picked up that needs a full transmission flush and, and cleanup. On and on and on. We've got a Tiguan that blew a timing timing chain again after we had done it uh, already once so there's a good you know five cars and at least four engine rebuilds that are waiting for this to be finished but in any case uh, you know we've got COVID my son had to stay home we've got family stuff it's just it's it's been a disaster all right so really 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 appreciate you guys uh, sticking with this um, hopefully it's, it's going to be worth it at the end what we're doing uh, in this last episode, so this is part one of the sort of last episode of the project. Um, I decided to split it in two because frankly, there's just too much to get into one episode. And um, honestly, it, it will take too long to shoot everything just because, you know, what we're down to now is, is sort of the last, you know, 20% of the work that really takes copious amounts of time. I mean, I think I rebuilt the entire rear suspension, front suspension and the engine in probably less time than it's taking me to get the cooling system sorted out. Anyways, obviously I'm exaggerating here, but the last 20% takes the 80% of the time. It's, it's crazy long. So how are we going to do this? So I've decided to split it into two episodes. All right. Um, this is called the finishing. All right. Uh, I suspect by the time the last episode is done, this is not going to be 100% finished. Um, if you've ever built a project or swapped an engine or anything like that, you know that it, it never really ends, right? I mean, I, I've had, I've sold projects way before they were even completely finished, right? So, so you finish a project, it's a daily driver and you sell it and, and it still has work that needs to be done because things always keep coming up, right? So in today's episode, I, it's going to be a long episode. We get a lot done today. So stick around. Uh, at the end of the episode, we're going to see what actually needs to be done for, for the second part. But in today's episode, we're going to um, hit the engine hard, basically finish everything that needs to be finished on the engine. All right, to change oil, um, oil pan gaskets, that kind of stuff. Engine goes back in the car. There it is. We're going to do some fun stuff. We're going to mount the Hoset HE200 turbo. So it's a new unit that, uh, that I found for this particular car. I usually use the four centimeter housing turbos that you can see on, uh, on our website. For this car, I picked up a seven centimeter because of the way the Westgate found it. We're going to talk about that. Also, I was able to sort out the power steering. Um, basically, we're going to build some brackets for that. Move the power steering pump out of the way so that the coolant uh, hoses can clear. We sort out the cooling, um, the intercooler for the, uh, for the car using a C230 um, radiator and intercooler that go in there. Um, we've got the cooling system fully um, uh, filled up and, and, and sorted out. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to stop. I've got the filter mounted, uh, the fuel filter that I was talking about in an early episode, mounted and ready to go. Uh, and the engine is basically up and running. Okay. Um, that's where this episode is going to stop today. Let's get right into the work. If you have any questions, feel free to um, ask them below. I'm by no means saying this is the best way to do any of this stuff. It's just with the sort of risk, you know, limitations that I had. That's the result that we've got. So like I said, big episode, stick around. Let's see what happens. Uh, 
guys, before we continue, I think we're about two steps away from um, putting the transmission back on, putting the engine in. But I have to stop here for a sec because um, as you saw, I was just taking the bolts off the oil pan. Now I noticed this was done before. So I'm not extremely surprised by it, but I just absolutely have to show you because I think as far as public service announcements goes, um, don't do that ever, okay? Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, have somebody else do it. Um, don't do that. Honestly, this is unnecessary. It's probably not the right word. Um, silly, stupid, maybe. The thing is, there's a gasket that actually comes for this motor, all right? Like you can buy the gasket, it was readily available. I think it's like 20 bucks. If you decide not to use a gasket, by all means, use the proper um, sealing gasket make or whatever the case is. This looks like bathroom caulking, honestly. And on top of that, whoever installed this just, I think they were you know, charging by the liter or something because this stuff is like everywhere. Like look at this. Like it's just completely, look at this. What is that? Like who does that, right? It's, 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 it's everywhere, right? If I, if I show you on the other side, look at this. It's like the, the, the bolts are full of it. Like look, look how much of it has come out on the other side where they actually put the screw in. Right, not to mention that this thing was actually missing like five of the bolts on the bottom. So maybe what they did is they just, you know, they didn't have enough bolts or whatever happened and they just, just chalked it full of, of silicone. Like this is, this is silly, all right? So please, 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 please don't do that for the sake of everybody. This isn't the first thing that I noticed on this motor. Um, I don't really know who's been in it before me. I think I showed you guys this, but you know, some of these studs have been replaced. Some of them haven't, some of them have different nuts. The worst, I think the worst thing that we discovered on the front here, they had actually installed this um, sort of spacer in reverse. So this is the right way, according to the manual. Um, what they had done is they had flipped it. Pro okay, I, I understand, you could have made a mistake on that, that's fine. The problem is that what they then did when they torqued the bolt down, see the lip there? This actually dug right into the uh, the wheel and it didn't seat it properly. So this did not, there's a there's a Woodruff key inside that holds the, uh, the, the damper here to the crankshaft. So when they didn't seal it properly, there was some uh, play uh, between the um, the wheel and the Woodruff key, and it actually chewed up the crankshaft uh, nose right at the right at the front here. And it's we've got it back together. I think we've got it. We've got it good. I think it'll be all right. But you know, something as stupid as that could actually uh, you know kill the motor, because frankly, if we hadn't discovered it, you know, you put some more horsepower down on this, um, you start. You know, you could just as easily shear this, uh, the Woodruff key and actually do a ton of damage uh, on the crankshaft, which I can almost bet you is not really available. Same as the camshaft. So anyways, if you don't know what you're doing, just please don't keep working on this stuff. Uh, let somebody do it that knows what they're doing. All right, let's, uh, let's get that old pan off. We have to replace the rear seal, put the pan back on, put the transmission on the engine, put the engine in the car. All right, let's go. Before um, I close this up and we mount the transmission, just wanted to show you something, guys, because uh, it caught me off guard, so it's good to know. Um, we had to replace the uh, rear crank seal. I had a leak. I think you uh, probably saw it in the video there. So um, I went ahead and ordered one, and on Rock Auto, I'm guessing your parts store, you're going to get one that looks like this. Uh, now, admittedly, when I went back to look at it, uh, the other version was available as well, so probably it was my mistake. The problem is that I didn't know what this looked like before I went and ordered it. So I just ordered this, it looked like it was a normal one. However, my engine actually came with the um, integrated flange and um, seal. So you cannot replace the seal on its own, you have to replace the whole flange. All right? So. In the parts store, they had 
about six different versions of this one and only one version of this. And this is the one I need. Now, I, I was trying to figure out at what point was the change done and um, I couldn't, there's no clear indication about it. So um, the best advice I can give you is to take your flywheel and your torque plate out, verify which one you've got before you go ahead and order it because that's what I did. I, I ordered this one because I thought that's what it was. Now, it does fit over it. It is the right seal. However, you have to, if you want to use something like this, you have to go ahead and find the flange on its own. And you can. They are available. I believe the 603 actually uses the flange and, and seal variant. And I believe it's actually offered on this engine as well. You just have to find yourself the Mercedes uh, part number and go ahead and order it, which is a lot more expensive. So this one was about 25 bucks. If you want to get the flange, if you don't have it, uh, I think it's about 80 bucks. Uh, and then the seal is like another 10. So anyways, we're going to put this guy in. Oil pan goes on the bottom. We've cleaned everything up. Let's have a look at that. Making noise. There's the oil pan. Nice and clean. So we're going to mount that up. We have a new gasket for it. Transmission is going to go. Transmission is going to go in and then the engine is going to go in the car. And then we're good to go. All right, let's do that. Now, before we can get this car out of here on its own, you know, power, um, well, obviously we need a working engine. And unfortunately, that's one thing I do not have right now. I've gone over the various options for the two engines that I was considering for this project a couple of times now. So I'm not going to go into great detail, but basically um, I've got the 606 in the car right now over the 602 because the 602 had uh, camware issues and I wasn't interested in reviewing the entire engine. As you saw in the trans the fitting episode, I had to go back down to the 722 for transmission uh, because the 722.6 did not fit in the um, transmission tunnel. And I wasn't going to go ahead and, and cut the tunnel and modify it or anything like that. I'm not interested in doing that. Uh, the 722.4 fits on the engine. However, the 722.4 has a couple of uh, controls that the 606 does not provide to it using the electronic pump. For one, it has vacuum control that comes out of the side of the mechanical pump in the 602, for example. And two, it has a Bolden cable, which uh, actually changes the shifts, I guess, when you have wide open throttle. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm an expert on it. I, I don't understand it. It's the cable that's right there. It's uh, the big red guy. It's this guy, all right? This is the cable. So we have this cable on this side, which controls the shifts, the wide open throttle, and there's a vacuum on the left side that we have to um, provide. With that in mind, the electronic pump would not handle either of those two. So I don't, obviously I won't have a throttle linkage to hook up the Baldwin cable to. And I also will not have a vacuum feed to um, modulate the vacuum going into a transmission. So actually the electronic pump right off the bat uh, would cause issues running the transmission. However, uh, that's not my biggest problem. I suppose I could have tried to figure that out, but my plan was to have an immobilizer defeat on the um, stock electronic pump. I cannot get it to work. Now, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I honestly have not spent way too much time trying to sort it out just because of the transmission issues. But um, at the end of the day, I bought a chip as an immobilizer uh, emulator and it requires a little bit of programming on the, on the uh, immobilizer chip on the computer. Uh, and I am having a hell of a time trying to read the immobilizer chip on the computer. The point is that I've now had to go down to the other option, which is a mechanical OM603 pump. I'm not in static about it. It's the best option, I would say, like for running this or is the easiest option for running this. Uh, it gives you the most amount of... Uh, upgrading possibility. Everybody's doing this, right? The 603 is basically the common go-to when trying to run the 606 in whatever it is that you're trying to run it in. But I wasn't too, too ex I, I wasn't excited about doing that. I wanted to try something different, something that people haven't done before, but I, I would admit to it, I have so far failed. And unfortunately, even, even if I went with a standalone controller for the 606 electronic pump, I still wouldn't be able to drive my transmission. So actually I am forced to use the 603 because it is equipped to handle the transmission. 
That said, um, here's the 603. I've done a little bit of cleaning on it. And I have to give out, uh, I have to give a shout out to, uh, to Dan in Toronto, who actually hooked this up. Uh, I ended up, I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, I was going to order one from Europe. Uh, I didn't, I certainly didn't find one uh, locally. It was uh, kind of becoming a problem for me. But uh, Dan actually picked up my um, old anti-slip differential from the W124. And at the same time, was able to um, pick one of these up for me. So we ended up trading the uh, sort of trading the differential for the for the pump. I'm super, super happy for that. Thanks, Dan. Um, you, you've saved me a lot of work and waiting on, on uh, shipping of the pump from, from Europe. So, so this, is, uh, this is phenomenal. What I'm going to try and do now is actually put the pump in the car. All right. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I am following a um, Diesel Pump UK video, which I'm going to link below, where Luke explains in pretty good detail how you're supposed to go about basically taking the electronic pump, the original OM606 electronic pump out and then putting the mechanical pump in and what do you do with the timing and all that sort of stuff. So um, I'm not gonna, this is not gonna be a do it yourself. I, I'll link the video, go check that out. But this is basically, I'm gonna swap that pump out. Now, one issue that I have is that my 606 does not actually have its timing mark. The, the thing has been taken out, I'm guessing, by the previous owner. So I'm gonna have to rely on the assumption, we ran the engine before we put it out of the car and it ran fine, it was, it was okay. So I'm going to assume it's been timed properly and I'm going to basically rely on the timing of the pump and spin everything, get the timing off the pump, take the pump out and then put the new pump in this exact same, like basically without spinning the engine, put the pump on the new, uh, um, the, put the mechanical pump in. So hopefully that's gonna work. If we're having issues and the engine actually does need to be timed, then I'm gonna have to go ahead and source a, um, like the timing marker that has to bolt onto the engine. I don't know why anybody would ever take that out, but I've seen weird stuff with this motor anyway. so. I'm not, I'm not too surprised about it. That's it. That's the plan. Let's go do that right now. And hopefully we'll get that engine started. All right, let's go. So now that I've got the pump out and to be honest with you watching uh, Luke's video, this thing was super straightforward. I mean, this could not have gone any easier than it actually did right until the point where he points out the fact that you shouldn't be rotating the other pump, the new pump, um, with anything uh, such as pliers, for example, because it might cause damage to the splice. Naturally, as I checked the pump that I've got, you guys can see that, let's see if it's gonna focus there. It looks like the previous owner did just that. So it looks like somebody basically grabbed this with a set of pliers because why not? You know, that's what smart people do and try to rotate it. Now, hopefully, and I haven't tried to rotate it actually yet, but hopefully this is not, you know, hopefully the pump is actually okay. Uh, I haven't tried to rotate it. I'm gonna try and clean up the splines first, but actually maybe, maybe I'll try and rotate it first just to make sure that it actually still spins. The pump rotates, so hopefully it's not, um, you know, dead, but basically what I have to do now is clean up the whole spline area. This is going to take forever. So it is what it is, I suppose. Not much we can do about it. So let's, um, let's tackle this. Now my camera battery died up. So I, I, I kind of kept going here. So off camera, I actually finished cleaning the splines and got the pump mounted up. Uh, I was quite worried about the damaged splines, to be honest, I thought that might be a pretty big job, but um, I was able to mount it, line it up, and I didn't really have to do uh, anything really crazy other than clean up the splines as much as possible. The pump mounted up, I uh, rotated it by hand a couple of times. The timing seems to be good. 
So I think we're okay. Now, I want to start this today, or at least try to. Uh, and the last thing that's missing for this is the actual fuel line, uh, the fuel feed for the pump. So uh, I just wanted to kind of talk very quick about the two options, just to kind of show you guys. So this is the uh, filter I took off from the OM606. And this is the filter I just took off the OM602, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's two ways you can do this. I suppose you could leave your uh, original system if, if that's the only one you have. And uh, when you watch uh, Luke's video, he explains very quickly which line goes where, okay? Now, the one thing that this system has, the, the, the problem with the original OM606 system is they've converted to all these plastic fittings which start leaking and then cause problems. And you can't really, I guess you have to find the fittings themselves to, to really make it work. So, so it's a bit of a pain in the butt if they start leaking. Whereas the original, uh, the original setup actually has uh, metal, metal banjos, right? So uh, with that, uh, this is a little bit better to use. And uh, the one thing I do want to do is I want to uh, replace these lines, but I want to use clear lines and I haven't found uh, a good source for clear lines near me. So, I mean, if these are fine, I guess I'll just leave them. Otherwise, I'll just replace them with rubber hoses unless uh, somebody um, has a good uh, source for, for clear fuel hose. Please do let me know. Comment below if you, if you, if you know about it, anything like that. Um, there's a question here. The 606, so they both, uh, both the 606 and the 603 have a fuel heater sort of thing. On the 606, it's up here. On the 603, it's kind of like sitting down here. Um, and the way the 606 fueling works is that the tank feed comes into here and basically the, the lift pump sucks the fuel through the heater, through the shutoff valve, which the 603 does not have, and uh, into the lift pump, into the filter, and then into the pump through here. So. For now, because this is using one of those plastic fittings, um, I am inclined to, at least for now, to bypass this and just go straight into the uh, lift pump and then into the filter. And the second thing is, um, I actually use aftermarket filters. I use the big cat, what is it, 3750 or whatever, uh, filter for most of my diesel builds. So I suspect uh, I'm ultimately gonna end up deleting the filter housing from here. I'm probably mounting it at the back under the uh, near the rear tire. Uh, big, nice big fuel filter horizontal uh, right off of the gas tank. And then that will clean up a little bit of space here. Not that I really need it. Doesn't really, you know, I can't, there's not much I can do here, but it will still clean up a little bit of space uh, and kind of simplify things a little bit. So then I'll have the tank into the filter, um, lift pump sucking in from the filter and going right from the uh, lift pump right into the main pump, okay? Or alternatively, if you really want to filter it, you leave this filter here and I can still put an auxiliary filter in the back. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, I can put, now at the back, I have the electrical connection for the fuel pump uh, for because it's a gas car. So another option is to actually delete the lift pump and have the electrical pump at the back. And this may be a better option because it allows me to actually, you know, like put a switch or I think it's already wired to the key. So as soon as I turn the key, it actually puts the fuel. So then you don't really have, um, you don't really battle with issues that you might have from the lift pump. Anyways, to start this today, we're gonna mount the old filter because it's more or less directly plug and play. And I'm going to try and run diesel porch through this, I think in the beginning, I'm gonna crank it up. Fill, actually, first I have to fill it with oil, crank it up get oil everywhere, try and see if we can build some pressure on the fuel. And technically there's nothing preventing us from starting this engine right now. So uh, fingers crossed, let's mount the filter and see if we can start it. Okay guys, so I've got more or less everything in place. Bumps in, actually I lied to you, I did have some uh, clear lines. I'm not exactly sure where these come from, to be honest, I don't remember. Hopefully they're not gonna be uh, falling apart. Well, I'll keep an eye on them. Hopefully they'll be fine. 
Um, starter's hooked up. Got my battery going there. Uh, these lines are open because I want to crank it up and uh, you know get some fuel going here before I start tightening everything up. We got fuel. We got oil. Oil filters in. I put the uh, oil cooler lines back in. And that's it. You think it's gonna crank? Let's have a look. Whoop! We got a starter. So what do we forget is the question. Let's try and crank it. All right. Well, it's cranking. Um, Hopefully we got some fuel in it. Nothing seems to blow up. All right, that seems good. Now let's let's see if we can hook up some fuel to this and see what happens. Right. So just uh, you saw it crank. That's fine. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do, I've got uh, a can of fuel um, down here hooked up the pump one thing I had forgotten was actually the drain the drain lines for the injectors there so I had to just make those up um, I just wanted to show you what I'm using here first uh, so basically this is a 50 50 of diesel and diesel purge um, this hasn't been run in a couple of years so I'm just gonna run this through the car um, actually if it starts well we don't have a we don't have the cool line actually so I can't really let it warm up but I'm gonna keep that can uh, with that 50-50 mix. I'm gonna keep running that uh, until we finish the motor and it's good to go. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing. I usually use uh, diesel purge in the tank anyways. So I'm gonna keep using that. And um, actually the oil I've got right now is eh, not a very good. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an engine flush, throw that oil out and then load it up with some good stuff. Okay, so this is just really the first turn uh we're trying to see if the pump runs um and after that we're gonna clean this up a little bit and uh, make it better having the clear lines is actually awesome because you can you can see what the system is doing all right here we go got smoke coming out of the uh, EGR which means that we've got exhaust which means that we've got fuel coming in through the injectors so hopefully it will fire up before the battery dies <laughs> Is dead um, I'm gonna go get a booster and see if that's gonna be enough and if not then we're gonna have to revisit um, I tried to stay saw me try to start it it's smoking but it's not starting now I forgot I had the same uh, sort of issue last time I was trying to start the six cylinder BMW we worked on the 724 we tried to build um, these motors do not seem to want to start without glowing so what we're going to do now is we're going to try and glow the plugs and see if we can start it like that. But um, here's the problem. Here's the 606 glow plug relay. Uh, seems like just like any other normal um, setup that I've had before. You know, with this this being the, um, you know, hot terminal, it's always on. Six plugs and just the control signal. If you look at the schematic, um, it seems pretty straightforward. The brown just goes to ground and the white just goes to the ECU for control. Unfortunately this is a little more complicated than that so by simply giving a positive to the to the white wire which is what generally the relays do you give it a you know you give it a plus and then it basically turns the relay on and, and gives power to the plugs this is actually electronically controlled so the com this is a signal wire this is not a 12 um this the white one here is a signal wire it's not just 12 volts so if i just give it power 12 volts here 
this thing turns on for exactly one second and just shuts off immediately. And I cannot, for the life of me, um, hold this on longer to try and actually heat the, the glow plugs. And I'm talking, you know, we need them on for like 20 seconds or something like that. So actually what we've done um, is we rigged it up where um, I've got six cables going into the six glow plugs. And I'm just going to honestly just give them um, just plus, you know, basically bypass the whole relay problem. So just give this a plus uh, glow, glow the plugs, and then hopefully crank it and hopefully start it. Okay, let's try this. Okay, I just wanted to show you guys real quick. So what did I do with the rad? So this is the rad off of the, what is that? CLK 230, C230, whatever the case is. They're 202, W202. Um, the rad fits basically perfect, dimensions wise, into the uh, 2.6190E. All right, now, as far as I know, the 2.3 has got a different rad support. So this may not work in all the cases, but in this particular case, this rad works really nice. Now, uh, there's a few little things that I did um, that you guys saw in the speed footage there. So all I did is I actually took the little plastic tabs off of my, where did I put it? Off of the W124 rad. Okay, so I just took the, the plastic mounting tabs off of that rad because the 202, uses a bit more strange looking um, bushings here at the bottom. So I didn't want to move the entire um, subframe. I wanted to do as little cutting as possible. So by using the other mounting uh, plastic tabs, I'm able to actually reuse the 201 um, original spots. Now, uh, you saw me guys, you saw, you saw me cut out the um, tow hook which sat right about there. And the reason for that is because I'm trying to open up space here for the intercooler piping on the left and on the right. And if I am able to get that done, then I can mount my intercooler here and just use these two ports without having to you know, do anything funky to go around. The cool part is that I actually have lots of room in the front and behind the rod here. So sit right about there. So you can see I've got lots of room to, you know, mount fans, you know, bigger intercooler, whatever. So that's it. Now at the top here, I just cut this out. I haven't cleaned it out yet. So I just cut this out. I cut a little bit of space here for my hood latch, which is right there. And wanted to clear up some space for the main, uh, the main support here. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reuse these stock little tabs here and basically put a little bolt right through the the hood frame so that I can just kind of grab the rod there and leave it at that. All right. Um, as far as the routing, this is kind of pretty stock location here. Um, I already told you I took the hydraulic pump out because my line has to kind of do a big 290s more or less. And the pulley for the pump is right there. So that's not going to work. Um, on the way out, I'm going to have to come out of the big thermostat opening here and into the right here the feed on this one is a little annoying because it sits right there you can kind of see that uh, it sits right there so I'm gonna have to do like a tight 90 here like a direct 90 in order to come up to my reservoir there through the pump there and then down into the um, heater core inside the uh, cabin, okay? Now, I cannot find my original pump, which is a little annoying. So I have the W210 pump. So I think this should work. We'll certainly take a look, all right? So let me, let's finish mounting this up. Let's mock up the intercooler. Let's see if we can get some 90 elbows on it. And if that works, then I'm gonna start hooking up the coolant lines. 
we'll get the turbo mounted and we'll go from right there. so back to the intercooler um you know i didn't want to cut this beam off um just because it's already there um it certainly strengthens up this but the more i look at it this is the uh, c230 compressor intercooler and it's just ever so tight plus it was just a little bit harder to mount so you know what i think i'm gonna do i'm just gonna i'm just gonna cut this off and uh see if we can mount see if we can mount the intercooler and the rod together using the original mounting bracket So actually, I'm going to end up using the rad and the intercooler off the C230 compressor because, you know, the two platforms are very, very close to each other and this fits really well. Um, it's not as ideal as I would have hoped, but it's not so bad either. Now, I'm using the stock bracket off the 230. So this is W202 uh, C230 compressor. So the stock bracket holds the intercooler and the rad together. Um, in the C230 though, it looks like the rad sits a little bit further back just by the uh, way the brackets are on the bottom on the, uh, of the mount there. And I would have definitely wanted this to move forward because I have some room in the front, but the bracket and everything mounted together just does not fit behind the bumper here. It, like the bumper's got this big thick support. And I don't necessarily want to cut that off. I could, I just don't want to. Not right now anyways. I think in the future, if I end up upgrading the intercooler or whatever, uh, I have lots of room to play with. So for now, with the stock pump and all that, I'm just going to leave it as is. I just wanted to show you sort of the fitment. The rad is going to tuck in behind the support here. Um, so I got my buddy Dan. I think he wants his rad to uh, sort of come out in front of the support, but this is gonna be very tight. Certainly with my mounts, it would not work. There's just, there's just not gonna be any room um, here behind the rod. So the rod's gonna tuck in the hood, the hood support. I'm gonna have two fans at the front, lots of room for fans actually. I'm really, I'm really glad about that. In the future, if I end up getting a bigger intercooler, I can remove the fans or put the fans on the intercooler or whatever. And I actually have room in the back here it's not entirely too bad so i can i can probably play with that as well there's there's the, the good thing is there's room here to work with it's just trying to find the best way to to do this now the neat thing is the way the intercooler is mounted right now um i don't have it doesn't stick out of anything i don't have to cut the support i don't have to cut anything so there's the intercooler right there and these are the outlets there any pipe kind of come underneath a little bit you can kind of see this is where so it's nice and tucked in the bumper here without any issues I have room in the front of the alternator and everything else all the rest of the pulleys just plenty of room and the neat part is that with the other frame gone this intercooler just kind of comes out real nice facing backward here. So I'm going to have to go from here to where the turbo is going to come out, which is right about there, which should not be too bad. Like there's plenty of room here. All right. And if we had a look at the other side, let me get some light going here. And if we had a look on the other side, it's kind of the same thing. So I've got the intercooler coming out right there and the pipe is going to be coming out right about there for the uh, intake. So lots of room like this. Actually, I have a lot of room here behind the, the, the bumper. So if I wanted to put like a side mount or something like that in the future, I can still do it. And generally, there's plenty of space to play with. Which, which I am really, really happy about. Uh, you know, I, I most of my swaps so far have been Volkswagen Audi TDIs, and usually there's just the, you never have that kind of room around the turbo and the front of the motor, or anything like that. And again, this now this is understandably it's a six cylinder going into a car that had a six cylinder, but still, 
this is uh, there's lots of lots of room to play with here. Now, one one thing I noticed yesterday is that when I close the hood, uh, I can't latch it. So it seems like the hood hits my oil cap here. I haven't 100% confirmed this and I'm frankly not really sure what I'm going to do about it because I don't feel like, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do. I maybe try to bring the, the mounts down a little bit below, try and find like a shorter mount or something. Like I can try and figure something out, but I'm pretty sure right now this is hitting the, the hood. Um, as far as uh, piping goes, not too bad. Um, I can't find my pump from the 201. So actually this is the 210 pump which I think is kind of, uh, it's already, the hoses at least sit there with for the rest of the car. So at least I know kind of where they're supposed to go. Um, here, it's not too bad. So from the reservoir, I'm gonna try and go into that 90 there. And then this is my original, but this is the original hose from the 124. So you can see the 124 rod was sitting quite a bit further out compared to where the 230 rod's gonna sit. So all I'm gonna do here is just basically shorten this one up. And I'm gonna use one of these Volkswagen Audi pieces that I love to use in all my swaps because it's gonna go right there in that kink. And it's gonna give me the um, the extra holes to go right back to the reservoir. So basically I'm gonna cut the holes right there, throw this guy on, and then push this in so it fits right in the rod. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, for now, I think I'm going to use the stock uh, rad outlets for the transmission oil. However, in the future, I'm probably going to end up going with a front mount oil cooler for that, like a separate one. And in fact, now that I'm thinking of it, I think I'm probably going to go with one cooler on the right for the oil and one cooler on the left for the transmission. So I'm going to have two separate coolers on each side just to keep the temperatures nice and um, in check. So let's get the turbo on and then let's go mount the fuel filter in the back so we can at least get the fuel uh, up here. And then once we have that oil feed and our drain line for the turbo, we can actually start the motor back up. Now, before I go and mount the turbo, I just wanted to show you kind of um, what, what I'm working with. Uh, this is a, I'll consider a standard whole set HE 200 kit, if you will. Uh, we sell these, they're on uh, eurotrashmotorsports.com. You know. Um, this unit, this is a new unit I just brought in. Um, my favorite unit so far for the small series, the 200 series, has been the HE 200 four centimeter housing. And for those of you that don't know how to figure that out, it's basically a number right there stamped on the inside of the housing all right so i've got a four centimeter housing i've been using that on a ton of our tdi swaps we have a lot of customers all over the world i think just the most recently um we sold a couple of turbos out in australia and new zealand that are using that turbo for their tdis uh we dynoed one of those at 250 uh horsepower and about 300 foot pound of torque and I think there was still plenty uh, to go over. The turbo didn't run out. I think we maxed out on the fuel for that one. So anywhere between 250 and 300 horsepower is what you're looking at. I think 300 is pushing it. I think uh, 300, you're looking at the, you know, HX30 sort of territory. But there's people claiming 300 horsepower out of these small units. Uh, it's not for me to say. Now, why did I go with this new unit? Uh, so this is again an HE200. Um, interestingly enough, the exhaust side is actually the uh, the same flange as the HE221 that we carry. So it's this it's this flange that goes on it. I originally thought it would have been the the HE200 flange that they use on a lot of these units. So you know, in reality, Hosa just kind of does whatever they feel like. I don't think they uh, there's any set rules about any of this stuff. I know I've had a lot of people that basically say, "Oh, I need an HE200, you know, gasket." Well. I need a picture of it because as you can tell, this is an HE200 with a 221 outlet flange. So unless you're gonna show us a picture of what it is you're actually working with, you're gonna have a hard time getting the right parts. Anyways, as far as kids go. So I went with this turbo because so far, this is the only one that I have found in the 200 series where the Westgate is actually not coupled between 
the turbine and the compressor housing. All the rest of the units that I have, the Westgate actuator is actually mounted on the compressor housing and is basically coupling directly between the compressor housing and the turbine housing to operate the Westgate. The problem with that is when you start, when you want to clock the turbo and you, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to have to clock this turbo because there's absolutely no way it's going to fit um, unless you're building the exact motor that this was built for. There's no way that the oil inlet and outlet are going to be in the right direction. So you're going to have to clock it. And the problem is when you start spinning, you know, the two housings and the CHRA in respect to each other, this no longer lines up. So you're going to have to take the actuator off of the compressor housing, and then you're going to have to fab up a bracket to sort of mount the actuator somewhere else. Now, it's not a big deal. You know, a ton of people have done this. I've done it on pretty much every single one of my builds. It's not really a problem. That's not, that's the, this is not a showstopper by any chance. This is probably the only fabrication you have to do to mount one of these turbos on pretty much any car you've got, but it's a pain in the butt. So, with this turbo, because of the way it's mounted, and they, they've kind of done uh, what they have on most of their uh, HX30s, 35, 40, all that stuff, which is basically the actuator is mounted on the turbine housing, completely independent of the compressor compressor housing. So that now you can just undo the, the, uh, the clamp here, take the locking pins out, and you can clock all three elements in respect to each other without ever worrying about the Westgate actuator. So this saves work. It's nothing, nothing all that crazy, but it saves work. The other neat thing is, um, I think the four centimeter housing auto it is uh, smaller, and it would have spooled a lot faster on the, um, you know, the OM six four six. I think at the end of the day, it might have been a little too restrictive for that, for that motor. Keep in mind the stock turbo on this is uh, in the range of an HX30. I think it's more of the 40, what is it, 42, 44 millimeter, whereas this is down to like 36, I believe. So, so this is a smaller turbo than stock. Um, so putting the smallest possible housing on it would have probably been a little restrictive for the more. So actually going with the bigger housing is not too bad. Um, there are bigger options. You can go to the 221, the HE221. Uh, for a little bit more on the compressor side. Uh, chances are that motors, I mean, a lot of people run HX35s and, and, and more, but I am on a stock pump, stock H603 uh, pump. So I'm really only uh, in the 150, 180 horsepower tops before I go ahead and build the pump. So I don't need a bigger turbo. This is, we're gonna do a nice new turbo. This is has, the unit because we're going to a 603 pump has to be converted to a um, pressure operated Westgate as opposed to the vacuum that's on the 606. So this is the choice. We're going to give this a try and we're going to see how this turbo operates. So to mount it, your basic components. Um, first of all, you need one of these 90 degree elbows to go on the compressor outlet. All right, it's a V-band. Unfortunately, whole set V-bands are all proprietary. So nobody really makes your standard regular V-band. I'm sure there's a couple of companies out there that can get you one made. Um, I've looked around, they charge way too much to just simply measure and make a V-band. So you might as well just buy the regular piece, they're not very expensive. We carry all of these. So boom, this goes there and then this is going to go into the intercooler um, inlet. Now, uh, gasket and flange. This is a pretty standard turbine outlet. Uh, OHE221s that I have met and used, use this same gasket and flange. Boom, this guy goes like this. We have the V-band clamp that goes for, uh, for this. And my exhaust guy used to just simply make himself uh, flare up the exhaust pipe to just mate to this and use the um, V-band clamp to go with it, not a big deal. Now the oil inlet is where I get the most questions on these turbos. So this is this guy. And I've had a ton of people thinking that, so this is the original Cummins fitting. And I've had a lot of people thinking that it's supposed to go this way. And then this is some sort of an AN, um, you know, fitting size. It's not. So let me, you know, once and for all, I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, this is an M8 by 125. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the right number. MA by 125 uh, thread 
that goes in here where you got your uh, copper um, o-ring nothing nothing crazy about this if you wanted to you don't have to use this kind of fitting you can go ahead and find yourself an maybe 125 either um, you know regular fitting or a banjo fitting whatever fitting you want to get in here so MA 125 so once you get into this and you use the stock whole set fitting the thing on the top is called an ORFS fitting or o-ring flat surface so you can see it I'll just take it off here for you so you can take a better look so this is an o-ring flat surface fitting this is a standard hydraulic fitting. The other side of this that's gonna bolt onto this literally is a flat surface. So what it does is it basically sits down and presses against this O-ring and seals the inlet. That's it. So any hydraulic shop will be able to make you an ORFS line. Now, usually for the swaps that we've done before, um, what I do is this fitting goes on the turbo. I get a 90. Uh, 90 ORFS fitting here into an AN4 or an AN3 line. So basically a 90 out of here into an AN3 line and into an AN3 to whatever metric fitting you've got on the other side on the motor. So we're actually going to take a look at that once I throw this on the car. And this is the line that I want to get made. So this, this gets done at a hydraulic shop. It's a little expensive. I'm sure I can manufacture them. I'm sure I can sell them. But... Honestly, it's easier. It's usually custom for every application. So you might as well just go get a hydraulic shop, make it one time and, and be done with it. On the outlet, a couple of different ways to do it. I personally like this little um, barb, barb fitting that I've got here. Uh, I have A and tens, but the problem is, and you can see on the two two ones, you've got a bit of an issue with how close the compressor housing is to where that fitting sits. So usually, uh, if you do end up using an AN10 or 12, whatever it's supposed to be, you know, the fitting is fairly large. So what ends up happening is you actually have to bolt the line to the fitting and then actually put the fitting in place because otherwise you cannot turn the big nut on the AN12. So that's it. That's that's all we've got. That's the kit. We carry all of these items. So if you have any questions, if you want to use something like that, you know, ping us up, uh, send me a text below and uh, let me know if you have any questions about running one of these on your um, motor. Now, as far as mounting, I think I showed it to you guys last time. I'm using one of these flanges. So this is a transition flange between the stock um, triangle KKK flange into a T25. Three out of the two out of the four T25 holes actually uh, match up to the triangular um, line. The third one is independent, and then you've got your two um, two separate bolts on top. So let's mount the turbo let's measure the line let's go get the line made and once we've got that we can start the engine up um, again and see it running because if i start it right now it's just going to piss oil out of my um, oil feed hole which is right down there all right so that's the big plan for now let's get this done Right, so I mounted this on the car just so I can mark it. So this is kind of where I want the oil inlet to be so it's nice and vertical coming in uh, the turbo. So to spin the CHRA, it's actually quite simple. You just undo this bracket, turn it, line it up wherever you want it to be, and then tighten the bracket up. The, the compressor housing is a little bit tricky. So actually, it is perfect the way it is right now, facing down on the car. But as, I, as soon as I turn the CHRA, the outlet's actually going to come out on the side here. So I'm going to need to spin it back up. So that's a bit of a problem. You have to take this bracket off, which is a little bit of a, I don't know if you can see it, the lockering here, which is a little bit of a pain in the butt, for one. And then you have to watch out because most, if not all of these units, have a little locking pin inside, which fixes the position of this. So what you want to do is you want to take the pin out in order to be able to spin the compressor housing. So... Why don't we just go get that done right now? Thank you. 
Now that we've got the turbo clocked, basically our oil feed is more or less directly vertical to the uh, to the turbine. Now, perhaps we can turn it like half a degree this way a little bit, but I mean this is not an issue. This is pretty good. So um, I can I can turn it a little bit more to the right, and then that's good. So now we just have to mount the compressor housing with the outlet coming down here so it doesn't interfere with the Westgate actuator. And that's it, turbo's done. So then I can measure the oil feed line and go get that done before we start the motor. All right, obviously be very careful, your turbo's open right now, don't ding anything. And now we have to get the compressor housing. Now the turbo is more or less the way it's mounted. It's, it's a bit of an angle just because of the way the manifold comes through. So what I wanna do is I wanna have the housing like this, kind of coming off a little bit of an angle away from the manifold. So when I get the, when I get the compressor elbow, you know, I have, I have some room. Now the, the neat part is that you actually have room to maneuver and plenty of degrees of freedom to go around this. So the last adjustment is actually gonna happen on the car, but for now, I think right about there gets us into a good spot, something like that. And then we can still hook up the line back up. So let's put the, oh, before I do that, um, this is a little um, silencing ring that a lot of people just remove off their um, whole sets. I personally don't mind the noise the turbo makes without their ring. So we're just gonna go ahead and take it out. And just like the other one, it's got a bit of a lock ring here that you should be able to just push out with a screwdriver, maybe a smaller one. There it is. So let's kind of remove that lock ring there. And then pull this silencer ring out. That's it. So now, we are ready to put this back on the turbo. Like I said, pointing down-ish. There it is good, nice and clean. There's still oil from the original assembly. So we are good. All right, let's flip this around and put the lock ring back on. Now this is what I was saying that the lock ring actually becomes a bit of a pain in the butt, especially if you're gonna have to do a final adjustment on the vehicle, you wanna make sure that you put this ring in a position where you can actually access it. So I'm going to, oh, we should've probably done that first. So I usually put it right about here so that when it's sitting on the car, I have easy access from the top to take the ring out. And usually the easier stuff is you just kind of put the one side in already and you just try to not kill yourself while you're putting that back in place. Like so. Wow, that was way too easy. All right. Make sure it's well seated. All right, so what do we got here? Manifold, oil inlet, straight vertical, compressor outlet comes out proper, waste gates in place. We can hook this back up like this. Come on, get it back in there. There we go. All right. And that's it, we're good to go. Right, the last thing I like to do, um, we've got the flanges on, oil, drain, feed, everything's clocked to place. The last thing I like to do is to um, 
port match the gasket to the turbo and actually port match the gasket to the flange after. So this takes a little bit of time. Uh, it's not necessarily you know required, but you can imagine as the air comes through, you want as nice smooth transition as possible. So all of this here will give you trouble, right? So basically this is the material that we got to remove out of this turbo in order to match the gasket. And then I can show you And if you want, on the other side, you actually have the, the flange. Now, because the flange is uh, fabbed up, it's actually much better. It's a little bit better than the turbo itself. So we can definitely take a little bit of material here as well, but quite a bit less than the turbo so that's the last thing i'm going to do and then the turbo is ready to be mounted and we're going to have to go make the oil line in for that here I got a couple of things done uh, I've mostly finished the cooling the cooling system now I've got a there's a hydraulic pump here on the 201 that basically sits between the motor and the heater core inside I can't find the original one the one I've got here is from the 210 but it's got an extra uh, nipple and I think that's for bleeding um, coolant into the tank which the 210 looks a little bit different so i'm gonna and, and this one's pretty old so i'm gonna try and pick up a new one but for the time being i'm just gonna bypass the pump and uh hook up the holes directly through just so i can get uh cooling coolant running through the system you know get it up to temperature so i can flush it uh and change it out so that's that um the big hose everything came out all right this is my hose for uh filling in the w202 radiator which with the intercooler mounted pretty good. Uh, we've got the rod here, no big deal. Now this bit, and the rod's gonna push a little bit like this by the time it's finally mounted. Um, this is a Volkswagen piece that I like to use. The, the problem is it, it's, it would have been better if I had a straight one, but I, I haven't seen a straight one. So this would be better if, um, you know, the hose, if I had a straight 90 straight into a 90, I think that'll make a lot more sense. Uh, so perhaps I'll try. I'm gonna run this now just so I can see how it goes. I don't have another um, overflow um, location here on the rad. I don't have a cap, but I also have the Honda rad that I picked um, ju just for that purpose that actually has the cap on it. So it's entirely possible that uh, I might end up running a different rad. But what, for now, I'm gonna go with this one. We're gonna play with it and we're gonna see what happens. So that's that. And then down here, I just need to hook up this uh, one more hose into the uh, engine. So that's pretty straightforward. I've got the shield mounted. Uh, I've had a couple of questions about clearance and stuff like that. I don't honestly, there's, there's not a lot of room. So this is with the stock uh, engine mounts, right? And we talked about the length and everything else. But, you know, pushing this further back, you, you're just not gonna be able to run this. I don't think the shield. Um, there's really not a lot of room here. I can measure it exactly how much it is, but you can see, you know, between the valve cover and the shield, there's just really not that much space. All right. Um, so I've got the shield up. Now, two things that I'm going to tack on now. Well, sort of. Uh, first of all, the previous owner bypassed the oil cooler, which is not obviously a good idea. But these things are pretty hefty, so 
I tried to find a rod at the junkyard yesterday, but I can't find a good oil cooler rod, um, oil cooler. So for now, I'm gonna leave it like this, just, just to get the engine up and running, make sure everything's okay. And I'm gonna try and find a rod. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert this to just regular hose. So probably cut, cut these lines right there and then just use a 5 8 hydraulic hose and probably bring the cooler in the space here. So we're just gonna go down around and into the cooler. But uh, like I said, these are very heavy duty um, lines and I don't have the original cooler to use them for now. Now, what I wanted to show you is I went to the junkyard yesterday uh, and I picked up a couple of little things that I wanted to show you. So this is a nice rad off of a four, I believe. Uh, God knows what it's from. Um, but this is for the transmission. So so I, I quite like it. It's a good size rod for the transmission. I'm not going to use the um, the original fittings on the 202 rod. So this guy's either going to go right about there somewhere with the hydraulic lines. Or I'm thinking of actually mounting it right behind here. Like this. Probably upside down uh, to get better, um, to get the drainage going. But... Uh, something like this, I think is probably gonna work a little bit better with just a little bracket holding it from the top. So this would be out of the way. Um, I can, there's definitely a room to put it up front here. Um, if I squeeze the, if I move the fan all the way to the left, I can definitely put it there and then have the hydraulic lines coming down here. So that's that's definitely an option. Uh, one of the lines is obviously coming on the left one of the lines is coming on the right, so it just depends on how the, the hoses will get routed up. But that's the, the cooler for the transmission. The next thing I did yesterday is I went ahead and got the um, turbo oil feed line made up. And I just wanted to show you guys because we talked about the orifice fitting. Uh, like I said, plenty of people ask me how this looks. So I just wanted to show you. Here's the actual fitting as it sits in the turbo. So this bolts into the turbo, this sits at the top and you can see that right there. So that's the orifice fitting. And this is the orifice um, 90 degree elbow that I pretty much use on all of my builds. And this is why it's flat surface. So O-ring is on this guy, there's the O-ring. And this is the flat surface that basically mates to the O-ring like this. All right, um, I, I really like this setup. I know folks change this, but this is a very heavy duty hydraulic system and pretty much any hydraulic shop will um, carry the fittings and everything else you need. Down here, I'm going into an M16, uh, going off of the, right off the block. So F, uh, M16 to an M16. So basically this bolts into the block and this goes right into the line. A couple of different ways you can do this. You can do this with an AN fitting on this side. Doesn't really matter. Like whatever the hydraulic shop has that will sort you up. That's that. The next thing, um, as you saw, the hydraulic pump is causing some uh, interference issues with the cooling, with the uh, rad hose. So this is supposed to sit right about there. But it's a little tight, as you can see. It doesn't really fit. Let's see if we can get better angle on this. So the 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 pulley just won't won't really work with the the way the coolant is, the cooling hose is. So the pulley won't really work with the way the coolant hose is, and it doesn't really matter how I do the coolant hose. It's always going to interfere with that pulley. So I have to pump bring the pump down probably about there. That's a little too low, and we got to keep in mind that the the belt still has to go over the water pump and clear the uh, the tensioner bracket here. So the belt still has to kind of make an angle up. So this will be a little bit tricky, but the 602 pump that I picked originally that I was gonna throw on there is actually not gonna work because the pulley there sticks out further. So that wouldn't work. But what I saw yesterday at um, the junkyard I was able to find a smaller pulley. This is off of a Volkswagen, I think it's a Mach 4. And the um, the bolt pattern, like this pulley has a double bolt pattern. So the smaller one is actually for the Volkswagen setup. The big one is identical to 
our pump here. So I guess I think basically the pump is the same or you know just a different generation, but uh, the setup is more or less the same. So this pulley fits on my pump and it's actually smaller. So I mean, it's nothing significant, but it will help a little bit, right? Like, I mean, they're still good. There's a, what is that, about an inch small in diameter there. So it'll be, it will help tuck it away a little bit. So we're gonna go with a smaller pulley. Hopefully the clearance is the same. It looks like it is. Smaller pulley on the pump, use the stock pump. And all I'm gonna do is actually fab up two new brackets that will shift the pump down and out a little bit to get that pulley cleared from the uh, the coolant. So that's that's gonna happen. Um, I was actually going to delete the pump and go with the electrical one. The problem, well, first of all, this thing is huge. Like it's very, very heavy. And I, I don't know at what point, like it is really an advantage to running this over a hydraulic or the, uh, over a mechanical one, because I, this is easily twice the weight. So, you know, this is off a of Mazda 3. I don't know why they would have gone and converted to this. I understand a fully electrical um, steering rack. So it's probably like you just save that entire hydraulic system. But to actually go from a mechanical pump, which is fairly light, to the electrical pump, which is very heavy, seems like kind of backwards move to me. Anyways, I digress. So that's the hydraulic pump. We're going to end up using the stock one. The stock 606 one. And the only thing I got to figure out at this point is actually the hookup for the high pressure side because um, the 201 looks different than the 210. So so this might have to, I might have to do a, uh, some sort of an adapter or something or just, got, just buy a new line. Just buy an original 606 line to go with that. All right. So that's the plan for that. And the last thing I wanted to show you was actually... I found this yesterday at my dad's garage, which is one of the downpipes that we made uh, a couple of years ago now to go with a W uh, a whole set H HE221 turbo. All right. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier in the video. This is my exhaust guy makes these. So what he does is he actually flares the pipe. I've had lots of people ask me about what, how to get the V bed for for the Cummins. I don't sell it, you know. We sell various, um, you know, downpipe pieces and stuff like that. But I don't sell the V bed on its own because my exhaust guy just simply flares the pipe directly to match the um, the V band. All right. So this is what what we do um, now. This is obviously thinner than than an actual flange, so you can put a gasket in here, like an exhaust gasket in here, to seal this. So let's see. I haven't actually tried this, but the idea is that, oh, it might actually even fit. This was built for an Audi, but it looks like it might actually fit in here as well. So you can kind of see how the exhaust pipe matches the uh, turbine outlet flange. And then with a V-band clamp and a gasket, you can actually seal this surface very well. And by the looks of it, this might actually work for the vehicle because there's lots of room around everything. It clears up the steering pretty good. So I might actually just end up reusing this downpipe. All right, so this is good news because then any exhaust guy should be able to just go right off of a, you know, standard exhaust flange down here and just make the exhaust to the back of the, the back of the car. Awesome. This, I think this will save us some work. So this is what I want to show you. So now basically today is just, you know, finishing lines, fuel and coolant. And what am I missing? That's it, actually. Um, we're going to crank the engine a little bit to try and uh, get oil into the turbo. And maybe start it. And once uh, I get the engine started, um, I'm going to basically stop here because after that, it's just going to be a ton of uh, cleanup and um, other stuff that I need to do here for the last episode. All right. So let's see if we can get this engine running again. And then we're going to stop the episode there. I wanted to show you what I'm going to do, what my plan is for the fuel filter here. So the issue that I have is that this is a regular 516s fuel hose there going towards the front of the car. But the thing coming out of the tank 
is actually quite a bit larger. Uh, it's either like a five eighths or a half half inch pipe. Now I cut this, the original setup has a hose coming down and this is where your fuel pump and fuel filter sit for the gasser, all right? It's got a, it's got a little bracket here and everything just kind of hangs off on, on dampers. So to make this work for me, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can try and uh, just do, I guess, a plastic fitting or adapter from here straight to there. But because we have a nice cover for this space, which goes like this, generally. So this space is pretty well protected here. Uh, this is where the fuel pump will sit. Um, I want to use this little cavity. And what I did is I've got this filter, uh, fuel filter mount with a fuel filter used on Cummins and a bunch of other large um, diesel motors. So what I want to do is actually, sorry, let's get away wrong. So what I want to do is actually mount this like this and then basically have a line going from the tank into my filter here and a line going out of the filter here into my hose. Um, to get this done from the top, I'll show you in a sec. Basically, we're gonna pull out the cables for the original uh, fuel pump. I'm not gonna cut them or delete them or anything like that. I'm just going to tape them up, take the fuse out because it's possible in the future, I'm going to want to reuse these. All right, uh, if in the future I decide I wanna go more horsepower, I'm gonna to wanna to do a fuel pump, like a lift pump here. So I'm gonna leave these so that we can use them in the future. And then from the top, we're gonna to try and put uh, a couple of bolts just to mount the fuel filter. Actually, you know what, I'm lying to you. It is gonna go this way. Yeah, there you go. So, so that's the that's the plan there. And this allows me to swap this filter out. Now, this allows you to delete the fuel filter in the front. Uh, this is better anyways. It's a thing, I think it's a 10 micron, it's got a lot more capacity. There's some concern that there's going to be water accumulating at the bottom of this because these are supposed to get mounted like that and the water stays in the bottom. But um, we're gonna see what happens. For now, I'm gonna keep the fuel filter in the front just to you know use the banjo fittings that are already there anyways. And I'm just gonna double up with this one in the back. Okay, so to get this mounted, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to delete these two little tabs here that hold the fuel pump. So we'll get rid of these. And then we're just gonna simply put three bolts through here um, to, hold, to hold the filter in place. And that's it. So I've already gone ahead and removed the seat. If you don't know how to do it, you simply press the little tab down and that releases the seat and you just pull it out. It's actually super straightforward. Um, this is the fuel pump um, cable. And like I said, I'm just gonna pull it right out of there. Boom, there it is. Leave the grommet in place. Tape these up and take the fuse out the front. But, oh, actually even better. Like you can even disconnect it right there. It's got a little plug. So this is even better. You can just unhook this and just, just leave it like that. So that's it. So that's your fuel pump hookup. It stays right there. In fact, I'm, I'm even just gonna leave the cable right there. I don't even, uh, it doesn't bother me. I put a couple of zip ties on it. So if we ever do wanna use it, you just, you know, plug it right back in, grommets in place, everything's good to go. Um, as far as where the pump is going to mount, I believe the mounting points are like right there on the other side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to mark them from the bottom, drill two holes and actually just put two bolts to hold it in place. Now it's possible we're gonna go underneath this. So we'll have to see how that goes. All right, but I mean, you know, this is fairly good um, structurally. So we're just gonna mount the filter and, and, and do that. All right, let's, uh, let's do that. So that's the filter guys. There it is right there. Nice and clean, lots of room, and then ultimately covered with the stock cover. 
so you don't see anything it's really just from the back here you can spot it and uh, that takes care of the fuel inlet one thing I just realized if I ever need to change this filter I better make sure to clamp the the two lines before uh, I take the filter out because otherwise the entire tank is just going to empty right through there so yeah that's uh, because of where it sits we have to make sure that we clamp the lines so that's it that's for the fuel filter now let's go finish stuff at the front now the last thing I want to do I told you about mounting the hydraulic pump it needs to it needs to get shifted so what I'm gonna do uh, I already mounted the smaller wheel from the Volkswagen so this will uh, help a little bit and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get a couple of brackets made up for the front and the back of the pump all right now I measured about three quarter inch I need to come down about three quarter inch in order to clear the coolant pipe so these holes basically need to come up here, which will shift the pump down. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fab up these brackets out of steel. Here's my original one, and this is where I'm gonna go with the new one. I've got the first bracket ready so you can kind of see it's not obviously it's not um, you know finished it's gonna be a little bit prettier than this but um, it allows me to measure and make sure that the, the belt goes all right before I actually go ahead and uh, fab up the second one so let's have a look so I've pulled the rad pretty much where it's gonna sit so it's gonna be nice and flush here with the um, support because and like I said there's probably better ways to do this than the way I've done it uh, I'm gonna run it for a little bit and then I'm gonna try to improve it what I wanted to show you though is sort of the spacing we've got here for the hydraulic pump so I tried the um, I try to belt the belt clears here and this will spin just fine so the belt's on, this is uh, 2040 millimeters or 204 centimeters. And as you can see here, we clear the hose just, just fine. It seems to go pretty good everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna have to obviously run it. I have lots of room here probably fit my whole finger in there um, I have lots of room on this so potentially no this should be all right I think it's gonna be good so once we run it tomorrow we can figure out whether this is uh, this will need any uh, adjustment whether the belt needs to be a little bit shorter possibly or um, we are okay just wanted to show you guys the power steering pump brackets just before I mount them up. So this one goes on the front. And the only reason I bother to machine it a little more is because it has to clear the axle here, the shaft. So this is how it goes there. And then this one's gonna go in the back. Actually, it goes like this. Now the back one, just uh, if you're gonna be doing this, just gonna show you the back one is offset. I don't know if you guys can see that. Let's see. The back one is offset. So the the distance on the car is exactly 60 millimeters. So this width here is exactly 60 mil. So actually you need a spacer. I got these two guys. You need a spacer on the bracket basically sitting on the back here. To be able to line it up properly all right so this takes care of the offset that you have on the original bracket there all right so let's mount this up and basically start closing this up because i think we're just about done
I think we finished everything we had to finish for now. Unfortunately, I got the wrong hose for the fuel filter in the back, so I still have to use my uh, sort of jug of diesel right there um, just to get it running for now. And the second thing I was not able to finish is the um, transmission cooler line because I'm missing the left side. And I have no idea why, because I have six pipes on the floor here, but not one of them actually fits. So I don't know what happened there. Uh, I'm gonna have to maybe rebend it so I can get it to work. But for now, I'm just gonna stop for now because uh, I need to get this running. I need to finish this episode. Uh, this is where I put the transmission cooler for now. Uh, it's just temporary, so I've got it with zip ties. But uh, once I figure out this is a good spot, I'm going to actually mount it permanently. I just want to show you this is where it's going to go. So it sits right behind the bumper there. It's going to have good airflow. I bent the uh, the horns up a little bit so, so they're out of the way. And then I've got my two lines going right into the transmission there. So that's where it's going to go. There's an option to put it up at the front, but it's going to get a little too complicated and it's not really going to fit nice next to the fan unless I go with the bigger rod. So for now, it's going to go there. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I've mentioned earlier that the previous owner deleted the um, oil cooler for the motor and bypassed it. You can kind of see that there. Um, I'm going to leave that for now, but I'm, I'm on the hunt for an auxiliary uh, oil cooler that's actually going to go here. So that's where that's gonna go. So transmission on the left and the oil on the right. Other than that, the cooling system is done um, as, as best as I can. Uh, I showed you the mounts. You can probably see the mount there for the hydraulic pump. So hydraulic pumps out of the way, the belt runs. Uh, we just primed the turbo up. So I got the oil coming out the bottom. Like I mentioned, you always wanna do that before you start it. It's a new unit, um, you know, you don't wanna run it dry. Lucky for me, I actually found a downpipe piece that uh, we had done for one of my Audis that seems to you know, work amazing in here. So I've got that installed. Um, this is the flange, the conversion flange between the stock manifold and the T25. It actually worked out really nice. I'm really happy with this unit. And that's about it. I didn't, uh, you saw when I clocked the turbo, it was pretty straightforward um that's it so my hope right now is to get the engine running get it up to temperature so that uh the thermostat opens up we get the coolant system um you know cleaned up all the air is going to be out of it and eventually i'm going to run a flush through it because you saw the goop that i pulled out earlier uh, i definitely want to flush the system so we're going to do that with the coolant and we're actually going to do that with the engine with the motor oil but that's going to be a little bit down the road um, so for now, let's get the engine started and let's just bring it up to temp. All right, here we go. Glow, 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 and start. Wait. probably in the system there. Oops. All right, guys. That was it for this episode. Uh, part one of the finishing uh, episode is done. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Obviously, this is great. Like, I hope you found uh, everything I talked about useful. Certainly, uh, I tried to answer a lot of questions that I had myself going into this. Uh, there's been 
tremendous amounts of help from folks all over the world, kind of providing information that if you ask me should actually be well, well, well known. Um, there really isn't a good single source for this kind of stuff, even though the 606 is a very common swap. So the same questions kind of keep popping up. So hopefully I answered some of them for you. Uh, certainly if you have any other questions, please feel, feel free to uh, um, ask them below. I, I love the comments that you guys are, are, are leaving and I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that uh, you know we can all learn together uh, from this experience. What is left to do? Okay, so this was part one. Part two uh, has to finish with this car ultimately driving on its own power out of this garage. So what's left to do? Uh, here's, a, here's a quick list in no particular um, order of priority or anything like that. All these things need to be sorted out before this car drives. Number one, throttle cable. Okay, so I haven't sorted it out yet. I know there's plenty of solutions. You basically delete the little um, fuel cooler bracket and then you put a little bracket there. So throttle cable has to be done. The transmission hookups have to be done. So the bolding cable has to be sorted out with the uh, new throttle linkage. Uh, and I have to sort out all the vacuum uh, to get the transmission going. Uh, otherwise, mechanically speaking, the transmission is ready to go. I just have to hook up the oil cooler lines. Uh, the next thing, the fuel is more or less sorted out. There's nothing else I can do there. Um, hopefully the timing is, is, is well said. There's really nothing I can do with the pump at this point. Hopefully it's gonna run well. It's still smoking a little bit. But hopefully when, as we start driving the car, things will clean out, the air will get completely uh, purged out of the system and we'll be good to go. Electrical is gonna be a big one, all right? So as of right now, there's no, the car is not electrically uh, hooked up. Um, the engine runs, everything's fine, but I need to get the car wired up and actually figure out, you know, all the things that are gonna start uh, causing issues with that. Headlights need to be mounted up. The engine needs to be brought down, like I said earlier, because the mounts are a little too high and right now, the oil cap is hitting the, the hood, so I can't close the hood down. So the engine needs to come down, you know, like ever so slightly, probably about uh, two inches or so, just so I'm able to close the, uh, the hood. I didn't, I didn't want, I had a couple of people suggest cutting the hood to fit in the, over the engine. I, I'm not gonna do that, like that's just silliness. So, so, so that needs to be done. The manifold needs to go on and I still have to sort out the intercooler lines. So the intercooler is mounted, but I still need to hook up the lines um, to, to, to get it going. Um, I do not have an oil cooler for the for the motor yet, so that needs to be sorted out. I'm missing a line for the power steering, so the high pressure line for the power steering pump does not work because I've mounted the W210 power steering pump onto the W201 chassis. So the W201 line is actually short, plus the fitting is different. So either I'm gonna have to find a stock 210 line and hope that works, or just get myself uh, a new line made up. Um, that's about it. Okay, headlights, obviously, you know, like the, the, there's lots of uh, tiny little stuff that needs to be, uh, you know, finished up. But other than that, the car's more or less ready to go. Big, 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 big task is the brakes. Okay, I've been talking about these brakes for, you know, the, pretty much since episode one about how we're gonna have these awesome brakes. They're mounted, uh, you know, the discs are up, uh, huge upgrade, but I don't have the calipers on. Um, now it's not, it, it, the brakes are not a complicated job, but it just needs to be done. And I just, I just keep pushing them down the line. The problem is I can't get this car driving obviously without stopping power. So I need to get the calipers on. I need to make a couple of custom brake lines, really no big deal. And I need to sort out the spacers to get the, cal the calipers mounted uh, and centered properly on the disc. That's it. Um, that's it for the brakes. The last thing is the exhaust. Uh, frankly, it's probably the only thing on this car that I'm not doing. Um, and that's just because I I don't have, I, I'm not good at it. Like I don't have the good equipment, you know, get the pipes bent up and, and welded properly. So once I basically need the car out of the garage, driving on its own power, starting and stopping, and you know, so I can drive it on a trailer and bring it to a shop to get the exhaust done. That, that would be it. That's where we're gonna stop with this, uh, with this uh, project. I don't know if the exhaust is gonna be in episode two or it's just gonna be you know, seven months down the road. I honestly don't know. But in the next episode, we have to wrap up all these little things. We have to get the car off the lift and we have to be able to drive it back and forth, maybe even go for a test drive, all right? So uh, I think that will depend on you know, the hood and, and what we can sort out. But we just have to close this project up because it's, it's just eaten way, uh, way longer than anticipated. That's it. That's it for now. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really excited because we're so close. Um, for, all, for, for the folks that have been following since the very beginning, 
thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. If you like what you see, thumbs up. Uh, if you want to see more and you're not subscribed already, click subscribe. Hit the bell button so that you can get notifications once uh, part two comes out. And once we're wrapping up with this, we're just going to jump into rebuilding, you know, like I said, I think four or five engines that are just sitting outside waiting to be uh, to be built up from a 4.2 liter Audi V8, uh, two two liter uh, TSI engines from an A4 and a Tiguan. And we also have to do a diesel swap into uh, an A4. Anyways, the list is endless. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.